Democrats proclaim they are ushering in a revolution and insist you join, but they're not actually ushering a revolution in. Meanwhile, some good news on coronavirus, maybe? I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Stand up for your digital rights. Take action right now at expressvpn.com slash Ben. We're going to get to all of the news in just one second because there is a lot of news and a lot of narrative being driven, a lot of narrative being driven, most of it false. We're going to get to that in just one second. First, you may have noticed that this is a crazy time. I mean, a crazy time because the stock market has been bouncing around like a yo-yo over the past several months. You don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, there's a twist and turn around every corner in this season six of Trump. It's pretty incredible. That means that you probably want to make sure that you have banked against the possibility of a downturn, that you have, you have made the diversification decision you should have made months ago. And if you had, you'd be a lot wealthier today. I'm talking, of course, about diversifying into precious metals with 40 million people unemployed and $6 trillion already spent on COVID-19. Well, inflation is probably on the way sometime in the not so far future. And this is why, among many other reasons, it is a good idea to have some of your money in precious metals and the people I trust, as you know, with my precious metals investing is Birch Gold Group. Text Ben to 474747 right now. When you purchase on or before July 31st, when you get a precious metals IRA, you get a free signed copy of my book, The Right Side of History. Birch Gold will go to work for you and make things super simple. Ask all of your questions, get all of your answers, be a fully informed investor. Text my name, Ben, to 474747 and at least request a free information kit on diversifying into gold. There's no obligation. Birch Gold Group has thousands of satisfied customers, countless five-star reviews, and A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. So protect yourself the way that I've protected myself. Diversify. You got to make sure that your asset base is diversified. Text Ben to 474747 during the months of June or July. When you open an IRA in precious metals, you get a signed copy of my New York Times number one bestselling book, The Right Side of History for free. Again, text Ben to 474747. Text my name, Ben, to 474747. All righty. So what is happening right now is pretty astonishing across the country. The basic message is that you will be forced to kneel. And if you do not kneel, then you will be castigated as racist. And when I say kneel, I don't just mean physically kneel. I mean that you will be forced to parrot the messages that the radical left would like you to parrot about race in the United States. And those messages are things like you as a white person bear inherent guilt for the sins of the past, that you may not have done anything racist, but you yourself are implicitly racist and you are part of the problem. You're supposed to parrot notions like the police are systemically racist. And this explains all inequality in arrest numbers. You're supposed to believe that America has a 400-year unbroken history of victimizing black Americans. Not that slavery was evil, not that Jim Crow was evil, but that today is just a continuum. That it's just a continuation of past policy in the United States. And therefore, again, all inequality can be chalked up to inequity. And if you fail to recognize any of this, then this is because you suffer from white privilege. That white privilege can only be expunged by repeating the messages that you're supposed to repeat. So you are supposed to, silence is violence. You're not supposed to keep silent. You're not supposed to shut your mouth. You're supposed to parrot exactly what the left wants you to say because silence is violence. And if you say something that the left does not want you to say, well, then, as we know, speech is violence. So silence is violence and speech is violence unless you act as basically a stenographer for the most radical left protesters and then suggest that you are on the same side. Now, that will not buy you off, right? You can do all of that. But if you are the Minneapolis mayor and you break from the radical left at any point here, well, then you will be eaten by the mob, right? That is the, that is the threat that is implicit here. And it's now pervaded all of society. And this is why you see so many corporations going out of their way to put out incredible statements suggesting that, no, I'm the most anti-racist. No, I'm the most anti-racist. But what have you said about George Floyd today? I'm the most anti-racist. Now, again, this is completely unnecessary, these statements. The reason it's unnecessary is not because anybody is in favor of what happened to George Floyd. It's because everybody is not in favor of what happened to George Floyd. Americans don't feel the need, as a general rule, to point out when 100% of Americans agree that something is evil, that something is evil. Because we all agree, right? There's no controversy. As I've said before, there are no protests today with people shouting the sky is blue because nobody actually believes that the sky is not blue. Nobody actually believes that black lives don't matter. So the Black Lives Matter protests are a suggestion tacitly that there is a group of people who actively believe that black lives do not matter. That is one of the open suggestions that is being made. Ashton Kutcher has said as much, right? He says that the reason we protest for Black Lives Matter is because there are so many Americans who believe that black lives do not matter. But there's no evidence of that. There's really no evidence that lots and lots of Americans believe black lives don't matter. So what is this really about? It's about driving the underlying narrative that America is inherently evil, that America is inherently bad, and that if you refuse to recognize that America is inherently evil and inherently bad and that the system is corrupt top to bottom, well, then obviously you are part of the problem. 
I, I have to read you a, a, an email that went out from one of these corporations because it really is astonishing. It's an email from a small company, I assume, called Memphis Rocks Climbing. It was sent to me by one of our listeners a few days ago. It's from June 2nd. And the subject is St. George Floyd. That is the, the subject of the email. It says, eight days ago, St. George Floyd was killed in front of the world. Yes, we call him St. George now, not because he was perfect, as we misunderstand saints to be, but because like St. George of England, who struggled with a fire-breathing dragon that was the devil, today St. George struggled with the devil of discrimination. He struggled with a fire-breathing dragon that, like all fire, stole his oxygen and robbed him of his breath of life. None of us here at Memphis Rocks knew St. George personally, but our guess is he might have shouted, I can't breathe, on any given day to an American that had cut off, ac- uh, that had cut off the oxygen for so many of his kin, the oxygen of opportunity, of equality, of access. Right? This is a religious statement. I mean, they're literally calling him a saint. This is a, this is a religious statement. Now, again, I'm not going to jump on the whole getting into Saint jo- getting into George Floyd's background or his personal life or the crimes he had committed in the past because I don't think it's relevant to what the officer did in this particular case. The officer committed an atrocity, and that's why George Floyd is dead, according to medical examiner reports. Everybody wants the guy in jail. The key here is the email. Right, the email is basically suggesting a religious revival around all of this. And the religious principle that you will be made to to repeat is that America is consistently cutting off the oxygen of opportunity, equality, and access for black Americans. And not just that, you are supposed to accept responsibility for all of this, says Memphis Rocks. I'm only reading this because this is very representative of an entire group of emails that have been going out. Corporations are sending them out to their employees. If you don't, then people get mad at you. There's a local gym in the area and somebody contacted me. They said somebody called and canceled their membership today because we had not put out a statement at all, right? Silence was violence. And so they canceled their gym membership because they like, I wasn't aware there were consumers who did this sort of thing, right? If, they, if you don't send a statement about a topic completely unrelated to your business, then they cancel their membership. But apparently that is a thing. According to Memphis Rocks, Officer Chauvin was not the only one who murdered St. George Floyd. Any of us who still harbored racist attitudes, no matter how subtle, we bear some of the weight of the knee on his neck. You are guilty, right? This is, a religious, this is a religious call. Any of us who are heirs to the benefits of enslaving a people upon whose backs we built our nation, a people who are then denied equal access to the very benefits we reaped, we bear some of the weight of the knee on his neck. Any of us who see no evil in the concentration of wealth in the hands of so few, while so many have so little, we bear some of the weight of the knee on his neck, right? So this is the call for revolution, that it's a class revolution, that if you do not believe that it is evil, for people to be rich in the United States of America, then you are guilty of the murder of George Floyd. The email's openly saying this. This is according to One Family Memphis and the Memphis Rocks team. It is no accident all of this is happening in the midst of a pandemic. The COVID crisis and the murder of St. George Floyd are not separate. The entire world wears masks now, each face metaphorically screaming, I can't breathe. And no wonder, we are not living in accord with, God, in accord with God's creation, choking her skies, soiling her rivers, labeling her diverse, beautiful people as other. Can you not hear the Godhead herself? crying out precisely, perfectly at this moment, I can't breathe. Today's news is not new. Racial divisions have been plaguing us for centuries. What's new has to be us. We must move from domination to collaboration. We must abandon the winner-loser model and embrace the philosophy of family. All is a brotherhood and a sisterhood. We are George Floyd, and George Floyd is us. Until that day is realized, we'll re- we will all remain masked, and none of us will be able to truly breathe. So th- this is from, a, a, I believe, a rock climbing company. Memphis Rocks, or, or it is from one family. Yeah, it's rock, Memphis Rocks Climbing and Community. So that, that's what this is. Okay, now that, that is a religious revivalist message, right? This is a tent meeting revival message. That's, that's what that is right there. And that message is now being put forth to all Americans that you are guilty of George Floyd's murder. You didn't do anything. You oppose the murder. You think it's evil? Doesn't matter. If you don't say exactly what people in the media would love for you to say and what Democratic politicians would love for you to say, then they will come after you. And if you, are a, if you are a protest leader, if you do not say exactly what a protest leader wants to say, then they will come after you, even if you're a Democrat or a media leader. Is this the way to end racism in America? I have serious doubts. Is this a way to make America more unified around things that we're already unified around, like violence is wrong, looting is wrong, racism is wrong, police brutality is wrong? Like we're 100% agreed on all of these things. But this is not designed to be a time of unification. This is designed to be a time of division by accusing at least half of Americans of being tacitly racist if they refuse to endorse the most radical messages about the remaking of America. And this is made explicit in a, in a column today by Dana Milbank over at the Washington Post called Trump's Republican Party displays its systemic racism. This is the narrative that's being driven. So how are they displaying their systemic racism? Because Senator Tom Cotton, who claims there's no structural racism in law enforcement, 
which is true. There is no there's no evidence that law enforcement bodies all over America are structurally racist. There are racists who are in law enforcement. Statistics do not bear out the idea that the police are targeting black people qua black people, that they are just targeting black people because they're black. There is no statistical evidence for this, as in none. That does not mean that there are, there are not racists who are out there in police forces doing bad things. But overall, the idea that police forces around America are rounding up black people, posing an existential threat to black people, it's not true. Again, does that mean that there aren't enormous number of bad run-ins between police officers and black Americans? Of course, that's true. Of course, that's true. But to attribute that to the innate racism of quote unquote structures is deliberately vague. And that's sort of the purpose here, right? When you're deliberately vague about what you're accusing people of, then they can't deny it. See, if you accuse somebody of, of being involved in systemic or structural racism, there's no way for them to deny it because they can say, but I'm not racist. Yeah, but I wasn't accusing you. I was accusing the structure. What structure were you accusing? The structure of America. Which institution? America. Which Americans? Every American who is white and has benefited from the system. But now you're accusing me again. No, I wasn't accusing you. Like, it's just this circular game. That's the whole purpose. Okay, so according to Dana Milbank, because Tom Cotton suggested that the U.S. military quash rioting and looting, this means he's a racist. And listen to how Dana Milbank twists the message. He says that Tom Cotton is a racist because he called for a, quote, overwhelming show of force, unquote, by the U.S. military to quash racial unrest. It was not to quash racial unrest. It was to quash rioting and looting. He specifically said, if you're protesting against police brutality or even against systemic police racism he disagrees with, of course, he shouldn't call in the military on that. This prompted House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn, African-American product of the segregated South and Democrat from South Carolina, to quote Alexis de Tocqueville, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. And then Clyburn says, Cotton's from Arkansas. He ought to be ashamed of himself. Ah, because Arkansas has a racist past, that means that Tom Cotton ought to be ashamed of himself because apparently he is just a product of that past and is tacitly racist. And so Dana Milbank says it was good to see Democrats back in the fight. They've been largely out of the debate for the past couple of months because the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi decided not to convene during the pandemic. Presumptive presidential nominee Joe Biden broadcasting from his basement did no better. They should be rushing to engage this battle for as the nation grapples with George Floyd's killing and what to do about persistent police brutality, this much has become clear. There is structural racism in the Republican Party. Structural racism in the Republican Party. What is his evidence of this? That there was a Republican chairman in Texas who shared racist stuff. That means structural racism. By the way, you know who doesn't get mentioned anywhere in here? Steve King, who just got primaried out of his seat in Iowa because people like me maxed out to his opponent, Kevin Finstra. Okay, and then they say, I, I love this from Dana Milbank. This is not the Republican Party of former President George W. Bush, who last week called for America to examine our tragic failures. Okay, I I'm old enough to remember when you called him racist over Hurricane Katrina. You on the left. So I don't buy your newfound respect for the anti-racism of George W. Bush. I think you're full of crap. They say, it's not the party of Senator Mitt Romney, says, says Dana Milbank, the 2012 Republican presidential nominee who nobly marched with Black Lives Matter demonstrators on Sunday. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember when Joe Biden accused him of wanting to put people black in, back in chains, black people back in chains. So no, I don't buy your nonsense. But this is the narrative. The narrative is Republicans are racist. The Democrats are consistently pushing this narrative. It makes it difficult to push that narrative on the back of an issue where we all agree like George Floyd was killed in an atrocity and the officer should go to jail. If we all agree on that, you can't say, right, but we agree on that, but you're a racist. You can't do that. Instead, you have to generate disagreement. The way to generate disagreement is to draw a broader narrative and make extreme demands of human behavior. And then if people don't participate, then you say that they are a racist. And this is deeply effective stuff because as the media keep repeating over and over and over again that black Americans are victimized by law enforcement, what you are seeing is that America's, uh, Americans tend to believe it. Rasmussen has a new poll. They informed the Washington Examiner that 51% believe that black people generally receive unfair treatment by the police. Only 32% disagree. Black, 70%, are a lot more likely than whites, 47%, and other minority voters, 53%, to think black Americans receive unfair treatment from the police. The survey found that 36% of Americans believe police discrimination is a bigger problem than crime in low-income inner city areas. 36 of Americans, 53% disagree. Okay, first of all, you're insane if you believe that police discrimination is a bigger problem than crime in low-income in inner city areas. That's, that's, that is a nutty position. It is nuts. If you're worried about lack of investment in inner city communities, if you're worried about lack of a tax base, crime is significantly a bigger problem than quote-unquote police discrimination in these inner city communities. By the way, you remove police from those communities, that's what caused, according to many sociologists, the spike in crime in, in inner city communities in the first place. There's been a wide differential in crime statistics between black and white in America for well over 100 years. And the, one of the reasons for that is because white America said, you're, you're on your own, police yourselves. And it didn't work. 
There's a great book called Ghetto Side by Jane Levy, who's a, a left-leaning reporter for the LA Times. She points out, remove the police from these communities, and what you can expect is an uptick in lawlessness. But again, the idea here is that the police are the problem. If you believe that the police are the problem rather than the solution to high crime, good luck to you. But this is, this is the symbolism, and it's all symbolism at this point. And what we are in is a symbolic fight, because it's not about policy, as we will see. And the Democrats are fully willing to engage in the symbolism of America is brutal, evil, and vicious, just so long as they don't have to do anything the protesters want. That's the, that's the exploitative revolution here. Yes, we're on your side. We're for the revolution. We're going to kneel like it's Wakanda. We're going to wear these kente cloths. We're going we're gonna to act like the white people from Get Out. That's what we're going to do every single day. And we're, we're on your side, man. We're on your side. And then, oh, yeah, you want us to defund the police? Yeah, we're not doing that because that's crazy. That is the Democratic agenda. We're going to get to all of that in just one second. First, let us talk about the fact that having a good HR department is the key to running a great company. You cannot afford, if you're running a company, to not be staffed up on HR. You can't. You can't afford not to have an HR department because one lawsuit can really put you in a difficult position. HR issues can absolutely suck up time. They can suck up money. They can kill you. But can you afford like an HR manager at $80,000 a year or $70,000 a year? Instead, right now in this economy, why don't you go check out Bambi? It's spelled B-A-M-B-E-E. It was created specifically for small business. You can get a dedicated HR manager, craft HR policy, maintain your compliance, all for just $99 a month. With Bambi, you can change HR from your biggest liability to your biggest strength. Your dedicated HR manager is available by phone, email, real-time chat from onboarding to terminations. They customize your policies to fit your business and help you manage your employees day-to-day, -day, all for just $99 a month. Month-to-month, -month, no hidden fees, cancel anytime. You didn't start your business because you wanted to spend time on HR compliance. You didn't. Right? We've had HR issues in my company. We have to staff up on HR. There's no reason that you should have to spend a fortune on HR when you can use Bambi. Go to Bambi.com slash Shapiro right now. Schedule your free HR audit. Get your HR in line. Bambi.com slash Shapiro. B-A-M to the B-E-E dot -E com slash Shapiro. Go check them out right now and get all your HR department issues ironed right out. Okay, so this has all become symbolic now because this is no longer about what policies ought to be utilized in order to curb police brutality. This is no longer become about saving lives in, in black inner cities. This isn't about that because removing police from those inner cities, it ain't going to save lives. It's going to cost lives, as we're going to talk about in a second. It's all about the symbolism. And the symbolism crosses streams with the broader leftist narrative that America and Western civilization more generally are tremendously, tremendously evil. And it starts with sort of things we all agree on, and then it moves to things that we absolutely disagree on. So, for example, there's been this real push to tear down Confederate statues. Now, this has been a long time push on, on the political left in the United States. And I understand the appeal. The Confederacy was evil. The Confederacy was fighting on behalf of slavery. I get it. And I definitely agree with the idea that taxpayer dollars being used to, to uphold Confederate statues, statues of Confederate leaders, that's a net negative, I think. But the question is, as Condoleezza Rice put it, whether you rip away the history so that you're never forced to confront the history. You know, we keep hearing from the left that we should confront the history. Well, maybe, it seems to me, that you might want to confront the history by being able to point to the bad people, the statue of the bad man, and say, in this country, these people were treated as heroes for 100 years and for decades before that. And that's one of the things that we, have, we need to move past. It's one of the, like having the reminder of America's evils from the past is a good way of teaching people about the past and also why we've moved beyond it. Instead, people are seeking to tear down statues, and then they are seeking to conflate all historic figures. So, for example, London. Okay, there's a picture. They're, they're not just tearing down the, the statues of old Confederate generals. In London, they defaced a statue of Abraham Lincoln. They defaced a statue of Abraham Lincoln with BLM and the names of various people who had, been, who had died in police custody or been killed by police, including people like Mike Brown. I, I, I am at, a, at wit's end to understand why it is that the Black Lives Matter movement wants to lump all of these folks together because not all these cases are the same. They are not. The Michael Brown case was nothing like the Eric Garner case, which was nothing like the Breonna Taylor case, which was nothing like the Philando Castile case. Like all of these cases are very different. Many of these cases are true atrocities. And some of these cases like Michael Brown are absolutely not atrocities. He was justifiably killed by the police officer in that particular case. Lumping all these people together is a cheap trick. And then to deface a statue of Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, with these slogans, is insane. There's a sign hanging around the around the waist of Abraham Lincoln's statue in London that said, we need a new world. And that's exactly the point for these revolutionaries. Tear down the past. People were defacing pictures, uh, defacing statues of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, right, who fought the Nazis and helped overcome the Nazis. Somebody defaced his statue in the middle of London and they crossed out his name and then says Churchill was a racist. 
Now, there's a lot of controversy over the level of Winston Churchill's bigotry. But if what you took away from history is that Winston Churchill was a racist, it's because you're a dumbass. If that is his great contribution to humanity, just like Abraham Lincoln needs to be defaced, then what you're really talking about is the, the defacement of all of Western civilization. If Lincoln and Churchill ain't good enough for you to have statues, then no one is. And that, of course, is the point, because no one really is. Right? The idea is the world must be remade in real time. And that, that, that is because the system is so deeply and thoroughly corrupt that it must be torn down. And this is why you see the push from members of the left in the media, in our political class, to suggest that racism in the United States is still so much of a threat that it is deadlier than an, an ongoing pandemic. Deadlier than an ongoing pandemic. Okay, that's fully insane. This pandemic has killed, at this point, 120,000 people in the United States since the beginning of March. It is just the beginning of June. So in three months, we have a pandemic that has killed 120,000 people with full lockdown. And we have been told that if you go to your business, if you go to your church, if you go visit grandma in the nursing home, if you, if you go and you go to the deathbed of grandma, that you're going to kill Americans unless you're protesting racism. Protesting racism is so necessary because America is so evil and Western civilization is so evil that, it is, that racism is a greater threat to Americans and America in 2020, not in 1865, not in 1965, in 2020, that you should go and you should spread the virus widely among other protesters to fight racism. Here was an N NBC News anchor trying to push this yesterday. I was out with, with other physicians and nurses in Seattle over the weekend where we had a Doctors for Justice march. And what were we doing? We we're passing out masks. We we're making sure if you didn't have a mask and you had a megaphone, you were protected. I asked some of my colleagues for handing out Purell. We want as much as anything for social justice to take the center stage because poverty, racism, they actually they have actually bigger killers than coronavirus by the statistics. So this is the right thing to do, but to do it safely. So masks all the time. Social distancing as you can do it. OK, so my, a couple of things there. Poverty and racism are not the same thing. Second of all, if you cared so much about poverty, maybe you should have thought about the giant lockdowns before you put 40 million Americans out of work. But you weren't allowed to talk about that, were you? But racism, so what he's really saying is racism is a bigger killer than coronavirus. I'm going to need like a shred of evidence for that. Phil Murphy, the governor of New Jersey, he's trying to extend lockdown for another 30 days. Meanwhile, he got tested for coronavirus yesterday because he was out protesting with people. We're going to get to this in just one second. First, let's talk about the fact that you might think, be thinking to yourself, in a time like this, can I still get life insurance? The answer is yes, you can. You have to go over to policygenius.com right now. As an insurance marketplace, Policy Genius is in contact with life insurance companies on their platform every day. They're keeping track of all the changes in the market so you don't have to, which means they can get you covered quickly and for the best price. Here is how it works. Policy Genius compares quotes from the top life insurance companies in one place. It takes just a few minutes to compare quotes from the top insurers and find your best price. This doesn't just save a lot of legwork. You could save 1500 bucks or more a year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and the red tape for free. So if you hit any speed bumps during the application process, they will be there to help walk you through the entire process. Honestly, if you are a decent human being and you want to make sure your family is taken care of, you really have no choice but to go check out some life insurance at policygenius.com. Policy Genius will find you the best rate, handle the process completely. They'll get you and your family protected, hopefully give you one less thing to worry about. Go check them out right now at policygenius.com. Again, that is policygenius.com. Get life insurance, auto insurance, disability insurance, meet all your insurance needs today at policygenius.com. Okay, so because all of this is symbolic, and the symbolism is about how horrible American racism is on a continuing level. You have politicians simultaneously claiming that if you go outside, you will die and kill grandma in the process. But also fighting racism is so big and so important and so endemic to American culture that if you kill a lot of people, well, you still won't have killed as many people as racism, which is a hell of an argument. I mean, at some point, you're going to have to show me. It's amazing. There are people who are talking about ending lockdown because they're pointing out suicide rises, opioid deaths, people without a job die deaths of despair. Their kids suffer. You, you can't, no, no. Hey, come on, come on. It, as Andrew Cuomo said, death is the only thing that we are worried about right now. We are not worried about any of those other issues. But if you just say racism kills more people than coronavirus with no evidence, none, zero, a grand total of, according to the Washington Post, 15 black men were killed unarmed by the police in 2019. And many of those are running away from the cops. And the classification there is not particularly clear. Okay, then... I don't know what to tell you. There's no statistical evidence. This is just a religious appeal. It is a root religious appeal. So here's Phil Murphy making the come to Jesus call that you should brave death in order to fight racism because it's just so important. This is a moment in time, perhaps unlike any in our nation's history. 
uh, there is an overwhelming amount of anger and passion. And by the way, it's all been incredibly peaceful. I mean, overwhelmingly so, particularly in New Jersey. And we should be very proud of that. Um, I, 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 I can't imagine what it would look like if we said to people, actually, you have to, you have to stay in. We, you, you have to ignore systemic racism. I'm sorry. Uh, for, for just ignore it. Just stay inside. You can't go out and voice, voice your, your, your anger, your rightful anger. Um, I can't imagine sorry, what that you, looks like as it relates. This to is crazy towns. You literally told everybody to give up their life savings and their business and stay inside and watch their parents die in a hospital alone. You literally told people they cannot visit their relatives. You literally told people that if they protested against any of this, they were violating your lockdown order. They couldn't go to church or synagogue. Can we tell people not to go out in the streets and yell about George Floyd without any actual policy ramifications? Of course we can't do that. Of course we can't do it. It's just that important to say that America is terrible and evil and racist. It's just that important. It really is because remember, when we get, to, as you will see, this is the message and the way you can tell this is the message is that these specific policy demands made by Black Lives Matter protesters are being completely ignored by Democrats. It is all about the symbolic adoption of the language without the actual adoption of any of the policy. So this is what Democrats were doing yesterday. So last I checked, Democrats in Congress, they're supposed to be passing legislation, right? You know, legislation to help fix the systemic racism of the United States. What were they actually doing? Nancy Pelosi is a terrible speaker of the House, but Nancy Pelosi is very good at coordinating outfits with the rest of the Democratic, with, with the Democratic Power Rangers here. So Nancy Pelosi, at the State of the Union address, she got everybody up in white, right? All the women were wearing white to demonstrate the purity of feminism. Well, now she got everybody a kente cloth, which, by the way, like, if everybody in Congress showed up wearing a talus one day, I'd be like, what in the world are you doing? What do you think you are doing? All these old white people putting on kente cloth to symbolize how much they care about black Americans. How do you not find this culturally appropriating? Imagine if Mitt Romney had done this at a Black Lives Matter protest. You think that he would have left there unscathed by the media? Like, does anyone think this? Meanwhile, you got old white Democrats like Nancy Pelosi putting on a kente cloth and kneeling for George Floyd. The best part of this is that she then could not get up. I'm not kidding because these are old white people who have done nothing to solve the problems they say that they have, that, that exist in America. They're so deep and so endemic and so root that you have to protest during a pandemic and widely spread a deadly virus. You need to do all of that. It's so important. Also, we've spent 50 years running Congress and we, and we haven't done anything, but at least we're kneeling for you. By the way, if you, if you get bought off by this, you're a sucker. Seriously, if you, if you believe that Democrats are solving systemic racism because they wore a Kente cloth, you're a sucker. You're an unbelievable sucker. And there's one born every minute, apparently. This is such cheap posturing. It seriously is. I'm, I'm all on board with President Trump shouldn't have done a photo op at a church, a burned out church with a Bible because it's a photo op. What do you call this when you have a bunch of old white Democrats who can barely get down on one knee wearing kente cloths looking like, as one person on Twitter put it, chess pieces from a Wakanda Black Panther chess set? It's absurd. It's absurd on every level. Okay, here's what it looked like when Democrats took a knee in Congress and then Nancy Pelosi couldn't get up, which was kind of hilarious. Again, just underscoring. She's been in Congress forever and has gotten zero things done, but she's virtue signaling to you. She's signaling to you. Here, here is Nancy Pelosi not being able to get up. <laughs> Their knees for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And then Nancy Pelosi literally cannot get up. She has to have an aide come and help her to it's her feet. not to have on high heels. <laughs> And then she's joking about it and laughing. It's better not to have on high heels and smiling and laughing. Oh, wait, these people take their, their symbolism incredibly seriously. This is nuts. I'm sorry, this is crazy. And also, even the very symbolism of kneeling, you know who you should kneel before? God, a person you're proposing to, a person you've sinned against. But the idea for many of those who are kneeling, including Democrats, is that we are not guilty. They're kneeling because they're not guilty. They're kneeling because you're guilty. Because if you're not kneeling, then you're not one of the woke. You're not one of the initiates, right? This is a religious ritual. And if you bow, then you're demonstrating you are part of the initiate woke. And if you don't bow, well, that is because you are not demonstrating that you have acquiesced and silence is violence, gang. And then you have Joe Biden. So Joe Biden is, is talking about George Floyd and saying that George Floyd will change the world. As we're about to see, Democrats are perfectly willing to pander to the radical aspirations of Black Lives Matter, but then do nothing. Joe Biden is a key cog in this. Here was Joe Biden talking about George Floyd yesterday on CBS Evening News. It's hard enough to grieve, but it's much harder to do it in public. It's much harder with the whole world watching. We're an incredible family. His little daughter was there. The one who said, Daddy's going to change the world. And I think her daddy is going to change the world. I think what's happened here is one of those great inflection points in American history, for real, in terms of civil liberties, civil rights, and, the, and the just treating people with dignity. So fair enough. What does that change look like? So for Democrats, what it means is that they posture, as we're about to see. So 
Democrats don't actually believe in any of the policy changes that are being promoted. We're going to get to that in just one second. I mean, what a sucker's game politics is. What a sucker's game. All you got to do is kneel and put on a kente cloth and pretend that everybody who opposes you is a racist and people will vote for you. All you have to do is keep repeating ad nauseum that the police are the bad guys and that rioters and looters are just acting out of justified rage and people will believe you. All you have to do is tell those protesters that you're on their side and then you don't have to do anything they want you to do and then they'll believe you. But only if you're a Democrat and only if you have the media's backing. It's pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible. We're going to get to more of this in just one second. First, let's talk about the fact that you might be worried about personal safety these days. I know here in Los Angeles, you know, while people were sort of rioting and looting and ransacking, I was sort of concerned about personal security. I know a lot of people were. I mean, why not? There's a Foot Locker three blocks from us that was robbed. There's a Walgreens three blocks from us that was robbed. And so I thought to myself, you know what? It's a good thing that I know what's happening on my property. And that's why I'm very grateful for Ring.com. Ring is on a mission to make neighborhoods safer. Their home security products are designed to give you peace of mind around the clock. From video doorbells and security cameras to smart security lighting and alarm systems, Ring has everything you need to make sure your family and belongings are safe and secure anytime, anywhere. With the all-new Ring Video Doorbell 3, you can keep an even closer eye on things than ever before. It's not a political statement to say that you should be worried about your family's safety and security at all times. This is true before the last few weeks. It's certainly going to be true after the next few weeks. I mean, you want to make sure that people are wiping off packages. They deliver them to you and not sneezing directly on them and handing them to you. Ring can get this done for you. Get a special offer on the Ring Welcome Kit when you go to ring.com slash Ben. The Welcome Kit includes the Ring Video Doorbell 3 and the Chime Pro. That's all you need to start building custom security for your home today. Just go to ring.com slash Ben. That is ring.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now and make your home and your neighborhood safer. All righty. So you may have noticed this, this year of news is insane and depressing and wild and crazy. It's a roller coaster of just joy and, and pain. It's unbelievable. And your media are not helping you because they are just woke propagandists. Well, if you need the reality of the news, what you really need is a reader's pass from dailywire.com. You'll get access to exclusive op-eds from us, your podcast hosts, as well as guest writers, in-depth analyses from our Daily Wire reporters on top of our regular breaking news. This membership tier is a bargain at three bucks a month. But if you join today, you get your first month for 99 cents. You also get access to our mobile app. You receive push notifications for breaking news and special content. And you can join the community of Daily Wire members who are actively commenting and discussing our content with each other. That is mobile ad-free access to all of the Daily Wire news, exclusive op-eds, and more on our mobile app, all for the low price of $1. And best of all, your dollars are getting you the news you need without the left to spin. So head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe and join today. Also, now is a great time to pre-order my book. It is coming out July 21st. It could not possibly be more relevant. It is called How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps. The basic idea is that there's a group of people in the United States, I call them disintegrationists, who would love to see the union come apart. They would love to shatter American philosophy. They say the Declaration of Independence is bad and racist, and so is the Constitution. They would love to shatter our history and say we don't have a shared history. We just have a history of the exploiters and the exploited, and you are a member of the exploiting class. And they would love to shatter our culture of rights and say that our rights are, in fact, just an outgrowth of our exploitative system. And that exercise of free speech and freedom of the press, exercise of free association, that all of these things are actually just white supremacism. I talk about all of this in my book, and I talk about why all of this is wrong, and I talk about what you can do to fight all of this. Check out my new book. It's coming out July 21st. It's available now for pre-order at Amazon or anywhere else books are sold. How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps. You're listening to the largest, fastest-growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. So as I say, it is all about the signaling. It's not really about the policy, as we're about to see. So what does this mean? It means that when Democrats hear radical proposals, they won't just dismiss them, but they're not going to go along with them when they actually have a chance to vote on them. So over the last 48 hours, there's been a call to defund the police. And it's been fun to watch the media spin on behalf of what defund the police means. Defund the police, it turns out, does not mean defund the police. It actually just means fund mental health services. Well, if you'd said that in the first place, then I kind of would have been on board, right? Keep the funding for the police, expand the funding for the police, and also make sure that you actually have services to take care of mentally ill people which, by the way, I've been stumping for on this program for literally years. I mean, you can go back and listen. I've done full episodes on it, on the homeless problem in our major cities, for example. But that's not what they called for. And the reason they didn't call for that is because that's not a sexy slogan. Saying we need to spend more on social services for the mentally ill and for drug addicts, that's not a sexy slogan. Defund the police is the slogan because the most radical protesters, the ones who are out chanting in the streets, want the police out of their communities. They're not being ambiguous about this. When, when the Minneapolis mayor, who spent the last couple of weeks begging forgiveness for his whiteness, 
from the Black Lives Matter crowd. I mean, seriously, that's what he did. He literally went in a crowd and he talked about his own conflicts and trying to expunge his own white guilt and all of this nonsense. And he was cheered for that. Then he was asked, do you want to just get rid of the police? He said, I'm not for abolishing the police. And people started shouting at him, get the F out of here and shame. Right. So the protesters are pretty obvious what they want. The Minneapolis City Council is even more obvious. They're not talking about just defunding the city police and then bringing in the county, which is what happened in Camden, New Jersey. A bunch of people keep saying, oh, it's just like Camden, New Jersey. Camden, New Jersey doubled the size of its police force. They're the most they're the most over policed major city in America right now. They doubled the size of the police force. They just went from the city to the county. It was like 250 people. Now it's 411 people who are policing that area. So don't tell me they defunded the police. They didn't. They just shifted responsibility for the police to the county. But Minneapolis went further. They said they wanted to completely reorganize how policing is done, period. But they obviously want to minimize the police footprint. So Lisa Bender, I played this clip yesterday, but it's so astonishing and it really is indicative of where the mindset is. Lisa Bender, who is the president of the Minneapolis City Council, she actually agreed yesterday that police don't make the city safer. That police do not make the city safer. Now, you cannot, you literally cannot name a case in which this is true, where removal of the police has made cities safer. It does not exist. One of the most robust social science findings ever is that when you remove police from a situation, criminals run free. That's common sense. Everyone knows this. I have a perfect case in point. For a week, the police were basically told hands off. And what happened? Rioting, looting, breaking into stores, people shattering windows, damage to cop cars that were out there on the streets. Then the cities were like, oh, you know, we actually can't tolerate this any longer. The National Guard came in, the cops showed up, and what happened? In two nights, it was over. In two nights, it was over. And by the way, in areas where they're not doing this, Seattle and Portland, for example, rioting and looting continue. It does not take a genius to recognize that when you remove police from high crime communities, crime goes up, not down. Again, one of the more robust social science findings in American race studies is that the removal of police from black communities in the early 20th century led to a radical rise in crime, which exacerbated inequality. But according to Lisa Bender, the president of the Minneapolis City Council, police don't make the city safer. They don't. Wishful thinking and singing Imagine, that's what makes the city safer. Here's Lisa Bender, full-scale idiot. Yesterday, uh, nine city council members stood together with our community and pledged to rethink public safety in our community and to acknowledge that the current Minneapolis Police Department is not working to keep our community safe. And really what we pledged was to start a year-long conversation with Minneapolis residents to help us reimagine what public safety looks like as we make those short-term fixes that are so clearly needed in our department. That was the uh, same lady who suggested yesterday that if someone calls 911 because their house is being broken into, she said this on Allison Camerata, that if someone calls 911, they should check their privilege. Right? You have to check their privilege if you're worried about crime. Okay, so here's the thing. Top Democrats have been asked about this defund the police thing. Pelosi and Democrats were asked about the Minneapolis City Council defunding the police and looking to basically destroy the police department from within. Here is a bevy of Democrats refusing to criticize the Minneapolis City Council for taking measures that obviously are going to make matters worse in high crime communities. People are calling it defund the police. Is that something that your caucus supports? Is it something that can happen in a federal way? Or is that just... Something- well, I can't imagine that happening in a federal way. But let me just tell you that part of that cry is a desire for there to be significant higher investment in communities. I think the Congresswoman answered your question very clearly. Uh, But the fact is, is that we do have a great deal of legislation coming down the pike that addresses some of the concerns of our communities across the country. Okay, so this is an explicit refusal to condemn that, right? And then Kamala Harris was asked on The View about defunding the police. And she refused to just say, well, actually, when we say defunding the police, what we don't mean is getting rid of the police. What we just mean is we're going to shift social services. Instead, just dodge the question from Meghan McCain. And then, of course, Twitter trended Meghan McCain because Meghan McCain is very bad for asking the most obvious question. What the hell do you mean by defunding the police? Are you for defunding the police? How are you defining defund the police? I assume it's removing police. And as um, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar said, bringing in a whole new way of, of governing and a law and order into, into a community. We need to reimagine how we are achieving public safety in America. And to have cities where one third of their entire budget is going to policing, but yet there is a dire need in those same cities for mental health resources, for, edu- for resources going into public schools, resources going into job training and, and, and job creation. Come on. 
By the way, spending money on job training and job creation is not going to stop criminality. It isn't. It is not going to. You need to stop the crimes so that people can invest in communities. You got this all backwards. The precondition to economic growth is not pouring state money into a particular area. We have tried this a thousand times and it always fails. The precondition to economic growth is a safe and secure neighborhood. And then people bringing their money in. That is the, that, otherwise, you know what you see? All the taxpayers leaving. Because where do you think this money comes from? Money doesn't grow on trees. Okay, so the Democrats refusing to explicitly move away from the defund the police program because they want to, again, act on the sort of fiery, the fire in the guts kind of uh, messaging of, of BLM. Meanwhile, you have a, a widely trafficked column by a woman named Michelle Alexander over at the New York Times called America. This is your chance. We must get it right this time or risk losing our democracy forever. And after recommending a bunch of books about about race in America, the same litany that you will see over at Amazon being represented, being represented by the woke, then she gets to her real message, which is we must fight for economic justice. And she calls for socialism. And then she quotes James Baldwin, who's a favorite, saying the necessity for a form of socialism is based on the observation that the world's present economic arrangements doom most of the world to misery, which again is one of the great lies in human history, is that socialism uplifts everybody while capitalism dooms the world to misery. Capitalism has lifted more than half the globe out of abject poverty. We have reduced extreme poverty on planet Earth by 80% since 1980. That is because of capitalism, not because of the rise of socialism. And then Michelle Alexander talks about Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King being a socialist and W.E.B. Du -E Dubois, founder of the NAACP, becoming a socialist. And Al Albert Einstein and Helen Keller and Paul Robeson all being socialists and or communists. Robeson was, actually was like a fellow traveler with the Soviet communists for a time during the 1930s. And then she says, no matter what you think about Bernie Sanders as a man or as a candidate, and I wish he was much better at addressing racial issues like reparations, we all owe him and countless organizers a debt of gratitude. Oh, do we? Do we? And she says, younger black people seem to understand the neoliberal democratic politics of the past will not take us where we need to go. And they supported Mr. Sanders by significant margins in polls. We must work to create an economic system that benefits us all, not just the wealthy. Okay, so we are hearing calls for socialism. We are hearing calls for getting rid of the police. And we are hearing calls for racial reparations. Leading the Huffington Post yesterday was an article about why we need racial reparations right now. So white Americans presumably should be spending money on black Americans, even though those white Americans never enslaved those black Americans. What should the policies be? Well, it would mean black Americans just getting checks from different organizations, which of course is not going to solve underlying problems in many of these communities. Problems of failing schools are not going to be solved by spending more money. We have tried that. Problems of family breakdown are not going to be solved with a check. That's been true in the white community. It's true in the black community as well. The idea that if you just cancel black student debt, like that's the biggest issue, canceling black student debt. Right now, the biggest issue is that there are not enough black people who are graduating from high school. We need to increase the number of black Americans who are not dropping out of high school. I mean, seriously, that is a major gap in American life, but we're not going to address any of those major gaps in American life because if you want to talk about truly uncomfortable conversations, then you have to talk about personal behavior that results in disparate impact. Right? You can't just talk about tossing money at problems or blaming white Americans for all problems. So here's, here's where it gets really cynical. Here's where it gets really cynical. So the Democrats have been repeating all this. They're wearing the Kente cloths. They're kneeling. They're repeating all of the slogans. They're suggesting that you're racist if you don't back all of these, all of these movements. That they're, they're expressing sympathy for rioting and looting on occasion. They're expressing sympathy for defund the police. Meanwhile, Chicago suffered its deadliest day in 60 years. They had 18 murders in 24 hours. This is according to DISRN.com. Uh, May 31st alone, 18 people that was mur murdered on Sunday. That was the most since 1961. The entire weekend stretching from Mar May 29th through May 31st, 24 people were killed in Chicago. Another 85 were wounded by gunfire. Nobody's going to remember any of these names and nobody's going to care because, of course, it doesn't back the narrative that America, that the big threat to black America is white police. And so here's where the rubber hits the road. The Democrats, they mirror all the messaging. And then when it comes time for them to actually mirror the policies, they're like, no, we're not doing any of that because they understand, they know these policies are not geared toward helping people. They know that the policies that they themselves are unwilling to condemn that those policies are actually bad policies. So what they want is the message. America is deeply and systemically racist. But then they act in ways that do not suggest that they actually believe that the system is deeply systemically racist. They are not going to bet. The Democrats are in control of Congress. Have they passed a bill on, on slavery reparations on what they think Americans should pay? Of course not, because they know that, first of all, it's unjust, and second, it's unpopular. Democrats are in control of Congress right now. Have they passed a bill to defund police departments across the country? They have not. In fact, Joe Biden 
who five seconds ago was saying that George Floyd is going to change the world, which is all well and good. He rejected the call for defunding the police, openly rejected the call for defunding the police. Here was, here was Joe Biden actually saying he's going to expand the funding for the police. Do you support defunding the police? No, I don't support defunding the police. I support conditioning federal aid to police based on whether or not they meet certain basic standards of decency and honorableness and, in fact, are able to demonstrate they can protect the community and everybody in the community. Amazing. So there he is, basically saying the same thing I'm saying about the police and how the police are protecting communities. But as long as Joe Biden signals, then he's saying something very different. Stephanie Rawlings Black, who is, I believe, the former mayor of Baltimore. I believe Stephanie Rawlings Black was the person who suggested that she was going to give space for people to burn in Baltimore back in 2014 when people were rioting. She said, we have to stop with this call to defund the police. It's just giving Trump a talking point. Weird, because you on the left are giving, are humoring this nonsense. You're humoring it and pretending like it's legit. Because again, what you want is the broad message. What you don't actually want is the policy that follows from the broad message. As I've been talking about for a week, Democrats basically set a controlled fire. They pushed a narrative that America is systemically racist and that if you oppose that narrative, then you are evil and racist yourself. You suffer from white privilege, specifically so they could pander for minority votes. And then when it comes time for policy, they're like, uh, you know what? Maybe you could take this crumb here. You can't set that fire and hope to control it. Democrats sooner or later are going to have to move in line with the defund the police crowd. That's the prediction. Over the next five years, this will become a mainstream call. I'm old enough to remember when Democrats said they weren't in favor of nationalized health care because that was crazy. Who would say they were? Whatever is the outlying position of the Democratic Party, within five years, it becomes the mainstream position inside the Democratic Party. Watch. It's going to happen in real time. So here's Stephanie Rawlings Blake saying, you know, it's really damaging for us to call to defund the police. Yes. Yes, it is. But, you know, dance with the gal that brung you. By continuing to say defund, dismantle, we are giving uh, Trump talking points. We are feeding his base. Uh, we all know that we can do better when it comes to policing. And I think that it's a missed opportunity not to figure out what better looks like together and a path forward, rather than to, again, have this litmus test of, you know, you're either for us or for against us when it comes to dismantling the police departments across the country. So what are Democrats actually pushing? What they're actually pushing, they push forward a bill. Their actual bill includes reforms making it easier to sue police officers for misconduct in civil court, so scaling back qualified immunity, which is something that has wide support, and prosecuting them for criminal behavior. It would also prohibit the use of chokeholds and certain no-knock warrants by police nationwide. Again, when it comes to chokeholds, you're going to have to explain whether you're talking about a chokehold or a submission hold, because sometimes police do actually need to stop a suspect from being violent, and maybe the best way to do that is to engage in a submission hold. The bill mandates the use of body cameras, which is fine. It creates a national database disclosing the names of officers with a pattern of abuse. It would eliminate the legal shield protecting police from lawsuits. Okay, that, these are all fairly mainstream proposals. You know what I'm not seeing anything in here about? Defunding the police. I'm not seeing anything in there about defunding the police. In fact, House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Republican, said he can't comment on the proposal because he hasn't seen the actual language yet. But he said that there are three possible points of common ground with Democrats. He says, I want to work and see that we get law. This is a moment in time. According to AP, not included in the bill is any nod toward the idea of defunding the police or reallocating police budgets toward other social services, such as housing, mental health, or substance abuse treatment, which some activists began calling for over the weekend. Also, nothing about reparations. So bottom line is pander, 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 pander. That is the bottom line here. Just complete and sole pandering. And if you buy this stuff, Honestly, if you buy that the Democrats are on your side because they're performatively kneeling wearing Kente cloths, fine, do it. But you're a sucker. You're a sucker. It's that simple. Okay, meanwhile, the, the media continue to abase themselves in front of the American people. It's pretty incredible. So America's newsrooms are being turned over to the woke. And it is an incredible spectacle. It truly is. Ben Smith had a piece of the New York Times talking about how newsrooms have decided they're going to go full editorial. According to Ben Smith, he's the media reporter now over at the New York Times, used to be the head of BuzzFeed. He says, as America is wrestling with the surging of a moment that began in August 2014, its biggest newsrooms are trying to find common ground between a tradition that aims to persuade the widest possible audience that its reporting is neutral and journalists who believe that fairness on issues from race to Donald Trump requires clear moral calls. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm in favor of the latter. I want all the masks off. I think that objective journalism is a lie. I think it's been a lie for a very long time. I think there are very few in the journalistic world who even attempt objective journalism. I've, signal, I, I've singled out people 
that, that I think have tried in the past. I think Jake Tapper tries sometimes on CNN. But I, I think that the vast majority of reporters are not reporters, they're activists. So I'm glad that they are now being open about this. The conflict exploded in recent days into public protests at the New York Times, ending in the resignation of its top opinion editor on Sunday. The Philadelphia Inquirer, whose executive editor resigned on Saturday over the headline, Buildings Matter Too, and the ensuing anger from his staff. The Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. It's been the subject of quiet agony at the Washington Post, which Wesley Lowry left earlier this year, months after the executive editor, Martin Barron, threatened to fire him for expressing his views on Twitter about race, journalism, and other subjects. Lowry's view is that news organizations, quote, core value needs to be the truth, not the perception of objectivity. I am so confused by this. What he really means is that his opinion should be treated as truth and that objective fact should not be reported to you because you might make up your mind in a way he doesn't like, Wesley Lowry. Lowry's view has been winning in a series of battle, many over how to cover race. He did Twitter criticism, helped to retire euphemisms like racially charged. Okay, but sometimes there's a difference in, in perception of whether a statement was racially charged or whether it was racist. So which is more accurate? That's an editorial subjective decision. The big outlets have gradually awkwardly given ground using racist and lie more freely, especially when describing Trump's behavior, which, by the way, has undercut their own credibility because it turns out half the time they're saying Trump is lying. He is not. They're saying that his implication is wrong, but that the fact that he said something like they, they never treat Trump with the same sort of. They, they treat Trump with a very different level of disdain when it comes to his prevarications than they do any other politician on planet Earth, obviously. The Times vowed to remake its opinion section after Senator Tom Cotton's op ed calling for the use of troops in American cities infuriated the newsroom last week. Again, the euphemisms. It called for the use of troops to put down rioting and looting in American cities. It wasn't just randomly sending in soldiers. Meanwhile, Axios has decided that its reporters are allowed to join protests. In a company memo, the chief executive of the politics news site said he supported staff members' right to march, adding the publisher would cover bail for any employee who is arrested. For any employee. So if you chuck a rock at a cop and you work for Axios, they're now going to bail you out. Jim Vandehey, the co-founder and chief executive of Axios, said first, let me say we, pr we proudly support and encourage you to exercise your rights to free speech, press, and protest. If you're arrested or meet harm while exercising these rights, Axios will stand behind you and use the family fund to cover your bail or assist with medical bills. That was sent in reply to an employee who had, been asked, who had asked about the company's stance on protesting as part of a weekly practice at Axios where staff members anonymously submit questions to managers. Exciting, exciting stuff. Now, ethics guidelines at the New York Times say the company's journalists may not march or rally in support of public causes or movements or publicly take positions on public issues, adding doing so might reasonably raise doubts about their ability or the Times' ability to function as neutral observers in covering the news. But obviously, Axios thinks differently. So we are now watching as the media basically strip the mask off themselves. We on the right have been saying for literally decades, you're a bunch of leftist activists disguising yourselves as objective journalists. And like, no, how dare you? We are so objective. We are journalisming up the wazoo, journalisming everywhere. Don Lemon, not an opinion guy, a journalist. Chris Cuomo, not an opinion guy, a journalist. Jim Acosta, not an opinion guy, a journalist. We are just, it's journalism, guys. It's reporting. And if you attack our opinions, you're attacking us as an institution. On the other hand, on the other hand, if we wish to join protests, and if we wish to suggest that a point of view is out of bounds, even though it is a mainstream American opinion, like America is not systemically racist, and that America's history of racism does not mean that America today is institutionally racist. Those opinions, if we just dismiss them as racist themselves, that's also objective journalism, which means that you've now redefined objective journalism. Also, the revolution continues apace. So the real revolution is not happening in terms of policy. I mentioned that Democrats are ignoring the policy proposals put forward by Black Lives Matter because they're patently insane. So they're just not going to do it. Instead, they've decided to take out their rage. The wokesters have decided to take out their rage at the liberal institutions they know they can control. They can't control Congress because the Senate is held by Republicans. They can't even control, can't control Congress because despite the vast size of these protests and all of the virtue signaling you see online, the vast majority of Americans are not in favor of defunding the police. The vast majority of Americans are not in favor of slavery reparations or remolding the American economy along socialist lines. Most Americans don't like this. Democrats know this. Democrats are answerable, not just to the Twitter mob. They're answerable to their own constituents. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna get what they want from Congress. What they're gonna get from Congress is a bunch of idiotic virtue signaling. That's what they're gonna get. So where can they actually get results? Ah, they can get results in the world of the media. They can get results in the world of sports, in the cultural sphere. They can get results by making Drew Brees' wife apologize for the great sin of her husband having stood up for the American flag. They can get results from Bon Appetit magazine. Very important. The editor-in-chief of Bon Appetit is a man named Adam Rappaport. 
He resigned on Monday after a photo of him in brown face resurfaced from 2013. It was him dressed up as apparently a Puerto Rican. Many former and current Bon Appetit staffers called for Rappaport to resign after the photo was posted to Twitter by food writer Tammy Teclamarium. Very, very important that this guy lose his job and his career because he went to a Halloween party. Very, very important stuff. Obviously supposed to be, obviously he's a vicious racist. Clearly he's a vicious racist. Rappaport said he had not championed an inclusive vision. I mean, this is malice stuff. They just put him out in the public square, hang a sign around his neck, I'm a racist, resign from your job. It's the cultural revolution in real time. It's good times. He said, ultimately, it's been at the expense of Bon Appetit and its staff, as well as our readers. They all deserve better. You're a food magazine. What are you... Are you a racist food magazine? I'm, I'm confused. The staff has been working hard to evolve the brand in a positive, more diverse direction. I will do all I can to support that work, but I'm not the one to lead the work. I'm not the one to lead the work. It was deeply important that he stepped down. Very, very important stuff. Great stuff right there. It's, this, is, this is the way that, that everything is going to work because the media is susceptible to this sort of stuff. And then Bon Appetit, Put out a put out the black square, right? The Black Lives Matter black square, which is white text on a black background. If you do that, anything you write in the text is virtuous. This is something that we know from online. What we know from online is you could literally just put anything. You could put the Star Wars crawl in white text on a black background. It is now virtuous and woke. They wrote, "Food has always been political, but has it really? Like always? Has it so much?" Sure, sure. Everything is political. Every single thing is political. By the way, if you mention that everything is political and it's annoying. Then you get trended on Twitter. That's the, that's the idea here. Meanwhile, well, they're not just going after, by the way, food is so political that they didn't just go after the editor of Bon Appetit. There's a woman named Alison Roman who was forced to apologize. She wrote a New York Times bestseller, Nothing Fancy. Okay, and she was a columnist for New York Times Cooking. I'm going to say was because I have a feeling that she's probably not going to be for much longer. Why? Well, because when she was 23, she did a Halloween party in which she dressed up as in an Amy Winehouse costume. Okay, she had big hoop earrings. But Alison Roman's white. If you wear big hoop earrings, hoop earrings are for Latinas. I, I'm, I'm dead serious. This is a thing that happened. This is a, this is a thing that happened. She wore a, a costume in which she had big hoop earrings on. And as we know, only Latina women wear hoop earrings. And so Alison Roman is now canceled. She tweeted out an apology. This incredibly embarrassing picture was taken in 2008. You're just wearing hoop earrings, lady. I was 23 and living in San Francisco. This was my San Francisco-inspired Amy Winehouse costume for Halloween. It reads as culturally insensitive. And I was an idiot child who knew nothing about the world, how this would be perceived. And I'm sorry. No, there shall be no repentance. You shall be cast out into the wilderness and cast from a cliff. That's the way it works in the world of media. And results have been achieved. Racism is being solved in real time, guys. It's being solved in real time. By the way, Jimmy Kimmel gets to keep his job despite having dressed up in blackface as Carl Malone way back when. He's okay. Totally fine. But Alison Roman, very, very evil. Here's the thing. It's never going to be enough because once you're in the culturally woke sphere, it's never enough. None of it's ever enough. Every, you can, you can bend the knee. You're, you're not going to be treated as a person who is now absolved of your sin. You're going to be treated as a person who ought to have their head lopped off Joffrey style. You can be Ned Stark and accept your expulsion to the Night Watch. You can, but guess what? You ain't going to the Night Watch, my friend. You're going to a very different place. The woke crowd is out for heads and they're going to get heads. And the best way they can do that is by targeting the media because the media are incredibly responsive to this sort of stuff. Many corporations are incredibly responsive to this stuff because they are risk averse and they are controversy averse. The left knows this. And this is why the left is, is ruining culture apace. This is what they are doing. So prepare for it. And everybody, everybody who's working right now in America and is receiving notes from their employers about how they bear guilt for George Floyd's death is feeling this right now. And if you speak up and you say, wait, I didn't kill George Floyd. I think it was evil. What do I have to do with this? Ah, you're not culturally sensitive. You're a white supremacist. You're secretly racist. Deep down, most Americans know this is crap. Most Americans know they're not bad people. Most Americans know they're not racist. Most Americans know they oppose police brutality and racism. Most Americans know that. And that's why the longer this goes on, the less it's going to achieve. Seriously. Because in terms of policy, it ain't achieving anything. And in terms of actually changing Americans' minds, I'm wondering how you change Americans' minds by by basically castigating people who are not racist as racist for not saying the specific words you want, and then by putting out videos of people kneeling before other people. Not sure how that is a good idea. All right, we'll be back here later today with two additional hours of content. Otherwise, we will see you here tomorrow. Also, I have an all-access tonight, so if you subscribe over at dailywire.com and you become an all-access subscriber, then you too can join in the fun. You can ask me questions over at the q and I wear t-shirts, which of course is the big pitch. 
Otherwise, we'll see you here, same time, same bat channel tomorrow. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Colton Haas, executive producer Jeremy Boring, supervising producer Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling, assistant director Pavel Wydowski, technical producer Austin Stevens, playback and media operated by Nick Sheehan, associate producer Katie Swinnerton, edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Nika Geneva. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. Chuck and Nancy solve racism by wearing African scarves, though, frankly, I think they need to go full dashiki if they really want to fix the problem. The experts get coronavirus completely wrong again, and the Minneapolis City Council president wants you to check your privilege of being able to call 911 in an emergency. All that and more, check it out on The Michael Knowles Show. Hey, everybody. 